large renal mass. Um, David, you're going to address minimal access surgery for some more complicated, larger um, T3, T4 tumours. Um, thank you very much. This talk is a, somewhat of a segue between uh, minimally invasive techniques and small renal masses for which there is considerable controversy and the, the maximally invasive surgery which we'll hear next, which I doubt there'll be too much controversy, but uh, it's the complexity of the surgery that's a fundamental issue. And I guess extending the minimally invasive techniques, it's really whether these, and specifically laparoscopic nephrectomy, has a role in locally advanced renal cell carcinoma. Now, in looking at this, we have to sort of define precisely what we're talking about when we discuss locally advanced renal carcinoma. And I guess most of us would regard that these encompass tumours defined as pathological T3 lesions with invasion into the perirenal and renal sinus fat, or where there is extension into the renal vein. Most surgeons, however, would uh, regard that the locally advanced have connotations when they contain the features shown here in red. That is where there is a significant extension to the vena cava, where there is invasion of adjacent organs, or where there is gross lymphadenopathy. And as shown in this slide, which is a full house of these adverse features, uh, there clearly are going to be cases where it's inappropriate contemplation that laparoscopic surgery be undertaken. Nevertheless, most of the what fits within those definitions of locally advanced disease uh, don't present quite such a challenge. And I guess with these, we then need to look at what is the purpose of the surgery. And these tumours can be broadly classified into those in which a surgical endeavour is embarked upon with curative intent, where maximal resection, radical resection, and complete resection, if feasible, is the ultimate goal. And I think, as with partial nephrectomy, it's not so much the, the method but the uh, outcome that's important. A different group is the cytoreductive, and where the principal purpose is actually just to reduce the patient's tumour burden and principally excise the primary lesion, where the surgical goals in terms of cure of the patient are somewhat different. I guess now looking at what is reported in the literature, and like everything in medicine, pretty much everything can be done and certainly is reported. And there's a large number of papers that report uh, surgical success uh, with the type of tumours that I outlined um, in the, the first slide. The issue with literature is that these are essentially anecdotal reports of surgical victories and also case series. And the features, particularly of the case series, is that there is inevitably a component of selection reporting bias and that in many of the larger series there is a relatively small median tumour size of about eight centimetres when they've reported it as a locally advanced tumour. And a further feature is that the case series are large, largely bolstered by pathological upstaging where the patient is found to have a PT3 tumour but clinically it began as a T1, T2 tumour. And so that does create a feature of the literature. Nevertheless, there have been an analysis of these series and I'd commend the excellent publication by Grant Stewart and Al from Scotland who have the, the largest series relating to this particular topic and clearly based on their fairly extensive experience it's technically feasible and I'd highlight in selected cases and precisely the selection process is what is debated and certainly in those in whom it is undertaken again comparing to similar I guess case matched uh, open cases the local recurrence rates time to survive time to recurrence and also long-term survival are equivalent with open surgery. It's not just important to consider what is in literature, we also have to look and be aware of what may not be in the, in the literature. An important factor is that series are often reported when there has been a very specific selection bias or referral pattern that is not representative of the true world, to quote uh, an oncology presentation this morning. There's also the issue of catastrophes, and these tend not to be reported in the literature, uh, but nevertheless are a well-recognised phenomenon with laparoscopic nephrectomy with locally advanced renal cell carcinoma. I personally am aware of currently four active medical legal cases in England alone over the past 18 months of patients who have died 
as an intraoperative or early postoperative death related to a locally advanced renal tumour related to vascular disaster. And this is where surgery was undertaken with gross lymphadenopathy, um, where bleeding occurred related to use of clips uh, as a result of the lymph node enlargement precluding the application of a clamp. And in two cases, superior mesenteric artery was divided because of the large tumour bulk obscuring the anatomy. Other catastrophic events are known with duodenal and visceral injury and also the consequences of protracted surgery, including gravidomyolysis. These are all cases that I suspect most surgeons are aware of, not necessarily personal experience, but by rumour and the fact that they are not reported. But nevertheless, clearly there is a safety issue in our case selection process. Starting to drift into the sort of more, um, I guess, technically challenging, and this is the group in which there is renal vein extension. And with careful selection, um, pure lap is probably feasible in a number of cases with level one tumor thrombi. This is those that are within the renal vein and not into uh, the vena cava. Prior occlusion of the artery will often result in some retraction of the tumor. And with use of slings and other devices, application of stapling devices is feasible. But again, this does come at a potential price with their reported incidence of positive margins at the safety at the staple line having where it occurred. Obviously the more adventurous cases are those at level two and three uh, and certainly there are individuals who have reported isolated success but again with hand assist and open completion being necessary. In the larger series where this was undertaken um, as an endeavour, this was a Chinese series, only 30% of those embarked upon laparoscopically ultimately proved feasible and so even with determination in a group we can see that only a subset ultimately proved feasible. So thus with laparoscopic nephrectomy for locally advanced disease there clearly are major technical issues which provide limiting factors and need to be borne in mind because this is clearly an issue of case selection and the factors to consider are the large tumour well, really, it's actual overall specimen size rather than the actual tumour itself. Perinephric fat is a major consideration. Cases in which there is profound or marked lymphadenopathy, which often obscures the vascular anatomy, where venous congestion is present with hematuria and non-functioning kidney uh, being hallmarks. And this is often an index of tumour thrombus in a vein and venous infarction of the kidney and where multivisceral resection is required, except with the possible exception of distal pancreas and splenic involvement, as these are standard procedures under perform, or performed by general surgeons. I guess other potential considerations are large right-sided tumours because of the small or short renal vein, limiting application of vascular staples safely, and perinephric neovascularization, although usually the pneumoperitoneum does not result in this being a substantial problem, but certainly it's a factor to consider. Cytoreductive nephrectomy is a, a different issue to someone who you're contemplating a curative procedure. Margins become less of an issue, and so therefore uh, we're not attempting or necessarily needing to achieve the radical resection of a curative resection. Recovery and morbidity are an advantage with laparoscopic surgery where this is feasible, and this will allow the early introduction or reintroduction of systemic therapy. Building on that topic, um, with cytoreductive nephrectomy, my anecdotal experience is that preoperative medical therapy does not increase the prospects of laparoscopic approach. And based on experience with three agents, generally in trial settings, pazopinib and axitinib are preferred, if feasible, if initial medical therapy is to be undertaken with a plan to subsequent uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy, and this relates to the intense desmoplastic reaction that frequently occurs with sutant and can make dissection and identification of anatomical planes very difficult. So in conclusion, I think if we're looking at the, the topic of the talk, and that's locally advanced renal cell carcinoma, I think it is a clinical reality, and this just does relate to the pathological upstaging of tumours that were initially identified radiologically as clinically T1 and T2. It is applicable in selected cases with clinical T3 disease, but again, this is dependent upon careful case selection with considerations of patient safety and also the surgical margins which one can realistically achieve, and this is obviously an individual surgeon decision. 
and I think it's advantageous when feasible, and again I stress feasibility and safety in the cytoreductive setting in that it won't allow more rapid recovery um, and the reintroduction and reduction of systemic therapy depending on the clinical decision in terms of their longer term management. Thank you.